Uh, okay, uh, we we'll come back to the seminar. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, Dr. Jordan Yang from Brown University. Uh, Dr. Jordan Yang got his uh, PhD in 2021 from Rutgers University. And uh, uh, his title today is a Gradient Estimate for Conductivity Problems from High Contrast Composite Materials. So Jordan. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. So I have been a, a regular uh, audience for this seminar like since three years ago, uh, except for the last semester when I have teaching uh, beauty as a katanga. So it's really my great honor to, to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, problems coming from a composite material. So um, let me just give, first give you the outline of my talk. So first I will uh, show you the introduction, uh, the problem setup, uh, uh, motivation, and known resource. So uh, the second part here would be a drawing work with uh, Hong Jiedong from Brown and, and Yan Yan Li from Ruggers. So the second part will be, I will be talking about our results on the optimal gradient estimate for linear insulin problem. So I will mention what that means. So this would this was a, a major open problem in this area. And then the last part of the talk, I will mention some recent progress uh, on the nonlinear problem uh, in this area. So this the last part based on John Wong with Hong Jiedong and Han Yezhu, both from Brown University. So, um, so this problem is coming from composite material. So let me just first give you a picture of what comp composite material is. So basically what you do is you just, you want to put a uh, different material together to provide a better material. Um, so uh, the thing we put into uh, inside the background matrix is called a fiber. And then the problem here is that when you put a lot of fiber together, um, there will be a scenario where those fibers are getting very close to each other. And those are the case pretty much we are interested in. So if you look at a cross section uh, of the of the material, so this uh, could be the scenario. These blue dots are the fibers, and when fibers are getting very close to each other, uh, there are like interesting phenomena happening. So I will mention that uh, in a second. So then we what we're going to do here is we're going to take a, a simple model in the electrostatics uh, setting. So we just take d one d two to be those two inclusions. Uh, the feature here is that they are very close to each other. The distance of these two is just epsilon. So they are very close to each other. Um, so for simplicity, we take everything to be smooth here. Just so smoothness is not the problem. Um, and our function u, the, the solution u is the scalar function is the voltage potential. And then the electric field is given by the gradient of u. So here, um, uh, another key thing is that we take the conductivity of the material to be different in different pieces. So uh, we take uh, the conductivity to be K1 here, K2 here, and then we just normalize the background matrix to be one. So uh, so then this uh, conductivity sigma is a piecewise constant uh, function. And then uh, the relations between current and electric field is, so first uh, in a very usual circumstances, this is given by Ohm's law. So we like we do this experiment in the middle school that we know that uh, the currents and electric field, they're linear to each other. But then uh, if you are going to in some like very extreme scenario, for instance, you, are, uh, you have like very extreme high temperature or extreme low temperature. So experiments show that uh, uh, this uh, current and the electric field relations could be uh, is better uh, approximated by a power law like this. So we will cover both um, in, our, in my talk today. And then finally, the, uh, the current is divergence free. So if we combine all these things together, we just get a very simple, uh, if the the uh the current law is the, the Ohm's law, then we just get a linear uh elliptic equations. And then if it's a power law, we just get this P la plus type equation. So uh this is a very simple looking equation. But the key feature is that again, let me uh, re-emphasize that. So is that uh, our sigma here is a piecewise constant. So you have this continuity across these boundaries. And then uh two of these boundaries they are very close to each other. So that's one of the difficulty of this kind of problem is that uh uh, in particular, when epsilon is go to zero, meaning that if you have those two inclusions being touched into each other, then you have a cast like in this region. Uh, so that makes a lot of elliptic theory invalid. So that's also one of the, the main difficulty. Right? So what is the what's the problem of interest here? Okay, so the problem was raised by Babushka, Anderson, Smith, Levine, 1999. So um, they do numerical observations. So they study the main system, which is a, an elliptic system. So they observe that 
if the constant k1, k2 are bounded away from zero and infinity, then gradient of u is always bounded independent of epsilon. So even though you like put those inclusions with this continuous uh, coefficient to very close to each other, uh, the gradient does not go up. Okay? So this is a very interesting phenomenon. So they ask the question, can we, uh, can people provide mathematical proof because what all they did was just a numerical observation. So they want a rigorous proof for that. And they propose that maybe people can start looking at the, the equation case, which was the conductivity problem, uh, the conductivity equation I showed in the previous slide, instead of looking at the elliptic system. Okay? And then, however, um, if we, the constant K1, K2 are extremely large, meaning that they go to infinity, or they're extremely small, meaning that they go to zero, so in this case, we call the material to be high contrast because the now the uh, coefficients are very different from the background matrix. So a numerical result also shows that in this case, you will have you will um, expect a few concentration between those two um, inclusions. So um, and such few concentration could cause a material value uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, like people start try to take advantage of these few concentration to like uh, design the material in a in a certain way to. Uh, to, to gain the uh, enhancement they want. So, um, so understanding this, so basically to summarize it, understanding the problem, understand the derivative of U in terms of these four parameters here, K1, K2, and P, and epsilon, especially uh, when epsilon go to zero. So this uh, is the main question here. And this question is kind of important as I explained, uh, both for mathematical and engineering point of view. So uh, that's the, our main problem here is we try to characterize the uh, the gradient of u. Okay. All right, so let me give you some um, known results, mainly on the linear case. Uh, Nonlinear case, there are still uh, is still on a at the early stage. So uh, for the linear case, indeed, um, after like within four years, a rigorous mathematical proof has been given for uh, the case when k one k two are bounded away from zero and infinity. So people show that gradient u is exactly is just bounded independent of epsilon. So, um, so first this is done by the, the numerical observation and then uh, Bonnetier Vogelius prove it in 2D for two touching circular inclusions, they prove that the gradient is bounded. And then this was generalized by Yan Yan Li and Vogelius um, to, to any dimensions and more general inclusions for the equation, for the elliptic equations. And then by Yan Yan Li and Nirenberg uh, generalized this to the elliptic system. So this elliptic system covered the uh, the main system. So, so this, so their result in two thousand three, uh, completely give a, a mathematical proof for the numerical observation uh, four years ago. So, yeah. And then in this re in this area, so there are still some like estimate on higher order of U. So given like uh, in the recent years. Um, so that's the uh, the story in this direction. So this result suggests that in order to have a few concentration, you have to go. You have to look at the high contrast material. Okay, because if K1, K1, K2 are bounded away from zero and infinity, there's no fuel concentration, the gradient of U is just bounded. Okay. All right, so since we are interested in the limiting case, so let me just first give you a very, some like very simple facts about this problem. So uh, this problem is equivalent to the minimizing problem of this uh, minimized in this energy. Um, and then the U, the solution U is just a piecewise harmonic in, in each area satisfying these transmission conditions on those two inclusions, okay? So if we want to take K to infinity, uh, if you look at the energy here, you can see that uh, U has to be a constant in those two inclusions because you can't afford any contribution from gradient of U when, when, when this constant is infinity. So, so that's, uh, the U has to be a constant in those two inclusions. And if you take K to zero um, from the transition, transmission condition here, you can see that the normal derivative of U has to be zero. Um, there. So, so this is a formal argument. You can make it rigorous, but um, but anyway, so if you take the limit k to infinity or k to zero, we end up getting uh, the perfect conductivity problem and the insulated conductivity problem as I show here. So for the perfect problem here, u is constant in those two uh, pieces, they are ui. So, so these two ui, you know they are constant, but you don't know uh, the value a priori. So this, the value of ui is determined by the third line uh, of the equation. And then for the insulated problem, you have a, just a very simple looking equation. So you just have a harmonic functions here, and then um, you have a normal derivative equal being zeros on these two inclusions. So that's the insulated conductivity problem, okay? So if you look at the problem, you might think 
okay, so that the insulated problem looks uh, much simpler. But uh, in my opinion, this problem is harder than the perfect conductivity problem. So let me uh, give you some intuition of why um, I would think that. Okay, so this is uh, like the picture of these two case. So if you have two perfect conductors, because um, your potential yield, um, the tangential derivatives is being zero uh, on those boundaries. So that means the electric field is going perpendicularly from one inclusion into the other inclusion. So they go like this uh, directly. So basically you can, you, you basically expect that the, um, the gradient of U, the most singular part is basically given by uh, U1 epsilon minus U2 epsilon uh, divided by the distance epsilon here, right? So uh, basically you expect this is it's not exactly equal, uh, something like this. So the, the, the main problem usually in, in perfect conductivity problem is to get a good estimate of U1 uh, minus U2 um, in terms of epsilon. And then because of the fact that U is equal to constant in these two pieces, so sometimes you can take advantage of this fact to simplify the problem a lot, okay? But if you look at the insulate problem, so for the insulate problem, because of the Neumann derivative, uh, the normal derivative is equal to zero here. So um, all this electric field, they just go like tangentially uh, through the, the insulators. And then this field concentration phenomenon is basically triggered by uh, the squeezing effects here between those two inclusions. So basically you do not know the value of U uh, around this boundary. So this boundary is not giving you too much information other than you just know that uh, the electric field are squeezing by those two insulators. And on the other hand, because of these squeezing effects, you might guess that, okay, that this field concentration phenomenon might be more sensitive to the geometry of the domain here. So, uh, so this problem, as I consider, would be much harder than uh, the perfect problem. And that was also the case, uh, uh, as I will show you uh, in, the, in the literature. But let me just give you, despite that they are so different, these two problems, but, but there's a, a very interesting phenomenon happens when dimension two and P equal to two. And exactly in this case, those two problems can be considered as dual problem. That's simply because you can identify R2 as a complex plane. And then if you have a solution U to be perfect conductivity, the solution of perfect problem, then it's harmonic conjugate will be a solution for the insulated problem. So this is just a simple fact of the cauchy riemann equation. So the tangential U being zero on the boundary is equal to the, the Neumann of V equals zero on the boundary. So, so these two problems are can be considered as dual problems specifically for n equals to two, p equals to two. And if you don't have, uh, you fall into other category, these two problems are very different. So that's one um, interesting phenomenon of this problem. Okay. So now let me show you some like previous result of uh, the linear perfect conductivity problem. So uh, the optimal blob ray was known uh, in about like 2020 years ago. Um, so the blow up ray is epsilon to the minus one half for n equals to two. And then this result was later generalized by Bao Li and Ying. Uh, to all the dimensions, don't need to worry about these numbers. Um, they, are all, they are all optimal. So one key thing here is that these rates, they do not depend on the curvature of the inclusion as long as they are strictly convex. Okay. And the method they develop here, Bao Li Ying developed here is uh, very robust in the sense that um, even though they're working on elliptic equations, they do not rely on any maximum principle uh, they, they develop a, a, an energy method uh, that can work uh, very robustly so that um, later, so this kind of method can be generalized to a lot of uh, linear system, for instance, like Lemming system and Stokes system, um, and it's still like producing work uh, very recently. Uh, and then uh, because the, the optimal rate is known here and there are many works to try to give a more, prescribe, a more precise description of gradient U by uh, writing out the asymptotic expansion in terms of uh, epsilon here. So um, that's the uh, the result for linear perfect problem. And then for the nonlinear problem, when you basically replace the Laplace uh, equation to P Laplace equation here. So there are not too many works uh, have done before. So only two works by uh, Goff, Norikov, uh, Cirado, and, and Sanmata. So they started this, they proved uh, uh, bounds for the L infinity norm of gradient U, and they show this is optimal. So when P is equal to two, uh, those number are exactly identical to this thing here. So um, yeah, so basically they, they extend this to P Laplace. However, the method they use here 
uh, highly relies on maximum principle and the fundamental solution of P Laplace. So um, in this area, there, there's nothing about the, the system case yet. Uh, there seems to be a, a harder problem for the nonlinear case. Okay. All right. And then um, for the for the linear insulated problem, so uh, as you, I will show you here, the development is much slower than the perfect problem. Uh, one reason might be this problem is harder, in my opinion. So, uh, but anyway, in 2D, as I mentioned, because those pro two problems are dual problems, so you, you have the same rates here, epsilon to the minus one half. Um, so this uh, is done by the, just by harmonic conjugate arguments. And then probably in 2010, prove an upper bound, just an upper bound of gradient U to be the same order for any dimensions. So in 2D, we know this is optimal, but it wasn't known that whether this, this rate here is optimal for dimension greater or equal than three uh, for a long time. Um, and then six years later, um, you uh, construct, uh, prove, give a proof for uh, a 3D case. Uh, he proved a bull up rate to be this order. And this, this number is, is strictly bigger than minus one half. So he, he proved a better uh, rate of gradient U in 3D between two circular inclusion, but he can only uh, deliver uh, this estimate on the shortest line between those two inclusions. So, so whether the most singular part is like outside those shortest line, it was not known, but this gives you a hint, gives us a, a hint that maybe uh, minus one half is not the optimal rates in higher dimensions, okay? And then for another six years later, so it was, uh, this was disproved basically by, by Yang Li and myself. So we prove an upper bound in 3D and higher, uh, to be ordered epsilon to the minus one half plus a positive beta. So that shows a uh, minus one half couldn't be uh, optimal in higher dimension. And if you go to like more higher dimension, four dimension and higher, so a more explicit beta can be obtained by uh, by, by Weinkopf uh, using a Bernstein argument, okay? So uh, still like after all this time like development, it wasn't known that uh, what this optimal beta is and, and identifying this optimal beta remains like a, uh, major open problem in this area. And this was highlighted by Kang at, uh, at the ICM like two years ago. So um, so the first result I want to uh, present here is a joint work with Hong Jiedong and Yin Yan Li. So basically we identified that optimal uh, blow up rate beta. Uh, and then uh, we also, because as I, as I mentioned before, because of the squeezing effects, so this field concentration might be very sensitive to the, to the geometry and we give a, a uh, very precise, we give an explicit um, uh, prescription uh, description of how this blow up rate depends on the principal curvature of the inclusions. And so that would be our, uh, the first result I, I will present in a second. Uh, but before we go to next uh, uh, next section, so let me just very quickly mention another case, which is a mixed problem. So what if you have like one perfect conductive, perfect conductors and one insulator, okay? So that means you put K1 to zero and K1, K2 to infinity, you mix these two things together. So they were, this was uh, also just started very recently, uh, first by Ji and Kang. So they show that in 2D, if you have circular uh, inclusions, if K1 is less than one, K2 is greater than one, um, they can provide this estimate uh, for, for the derivative of U. So in particular, if M is equal to one, you can see the right-hand side is just bounded by C. So they show that the gradient uh, is bounded in this case, okay? And then uh, in the joint work with Tong Jiedong, so we uh, extend this result. So we show that either under the same condition, so the first line is the same condition we have, or if we allowed K1 and K2 to be the extreme value, uh, meaning that K1 is equal to zero, K2 is equal to infinity, then we are able to relax the dimension to any dimensions, and we are able to relax the shape of D1 and D2. And then we, uh, more importantly, we are able to show that all derivatives are bounded, not just the first derivative, any derivatives are, is bounded in this case. Okay? So intuitively, uh, this um, also makes sense because if you just have a, a perfect conductor and an insulator putting them together, so they do not have any like competing effect between these two. So you uh, expect the solution should be very regular in this case. Right? Okay, so, so that, that is the, the history I want to talk about. Uh, there any any question or, or comments? Okay. All right, so let me start the, the second part. So the second part I want to uh, talk about our result. 
uh, with Hong Jiedong and Yan Lie on this uh, optimal uh, flow up rates of the linear insulated problem. Okay. So let me first just give you a very uh, simple reduction of the problem uh, because uh, uh, by the classical gradient estimate, we know that gradient of U is always bounded like away from this area. Okay, so basically we know that the, the fuel concentration can only happen in this uh, narrow region. So we just take out those region and we zoom in. We look, just focus on these regions called the narrow region. And then uh, here is just some uh, uh, notation. So basically what we do here is we just write uh, the upper boundary to be uh, gamma plus. Um, this is a graph of epsilon over two plus fx. And then the lower one is minus uh, epsilon over two plus gx. And then, uh, and more importantly is this notation here, omega r. So omega r here would be a cylindrical, sorry, would be a cylindrical region um, here of the radius r, okay? So um, uh, so uh, then we just need to focus on the problem near the origin. So this is a very simple looking problem. Uh, we just have a harmonic functions here, and then we will have a normal boundary conditions, uh, normal boundary condition uh, being zero on the upper and lower boundary. So this will be our problem, okay. So our results, so first uh, we consider two cases. So first we consider an asymptotically radial case, uh, meaning that um, if we look at the, the expansion of F minus G and we assume that the second order is radial um, in X prime. And in this case, we uh, prove the following gradient estimate. So we show that the gradient of U uh, is bounded by epsilon to this power alpha minus one over two, and alpha is given by this number. I will explain uh, this number in a second, but this is our, our theorem here. Uh, this is the same theorem. Uh, so several points here I want to make is first, we provide example to show that this is optimal. Like um, that's the, the main concern here. We want the optimal uh, exponent here. And then we provide example to show that uh, we do have example whose uh, derivative has a, can achieve these rates, these flow up rates here. And then uh, if you look at the, uh, the formulation of, of alpha here, so we can see that alpha is monotonically increasing in n and it's given by this uh, relation. So if you take n go to infinity, alpha will go to one, meaning that uh, the singularity here, the exponent here will go to zero. So the, uh, uh, so the singularity will diminish as n go to infinity. So that's different from perfect conductivity problems. So for perfect one, as long as you reach dimension four, you always have the same blow up rates, but uh, that's not the case for the insulated problem, okay? And for n equal to three, um, our exponent here actually just match uh, what you did in 2016, uh, what he did in the, in the shortest distance between two circular inclusions. So turns out that is the optimal rates. Uh, so we, we confirmed that. So um, that's the, the result for, the, for our first case. And the second case is a general case when uh, the expansion of F minus G is not radial here in uh, the second order, okay? So in this case, we show that the optimal blow up rate is linked to this eigenvalue problem on uh, uh, S N minus two. And here the coefficient A psi is just given by uh, psi transpose times the Hessian of F minus G at zero times psi here, okay? So the, uh, and then we take number one to be the first eigenvalue of this problem. And then we set this, uh, exponent here to be to be this number. So this will be the exponent we are looking at. And here, uh, the geometry enters here. Uh, so the principal curvature at zero points uh, enters here into the coefficient of A. And then we say that this, uh, the first eigenvalue will provide uh, the formula here gives us the, uh, the, the optimal exponent we want. All right, and for this case, we are able to prove the uh, gradient estimate as well. Um, so again, so gradient of U is bounded by epsilon to, to this order. Uh, but here I want to point out that um, we can only prove when alpha is strictly less than the number I showed in the previous slide. So we missed the, the equal sign here um, due to some like technical issue. Um, but when epsilon is equal to zero, meaning that if we have two inclusions touching to each other, we are able to prove the theorem with alpha equal to, to the number we want. And then we have example to show this is optimal. Okay. And another point is that um, our, our method can be generalized to, uh, to a, a slightly more general elliptic equation other than just harmonic equation, uh, harmonic functions. 
So um, uh, with, we, can, we can do that for divergence form with holder continuous um, coefficient. All right, okay. So let me give you a, a connections between uh, those two cases. Uh, so if we are in the first case when the second order expansion here is radial, then um, if you look at the function a psi here, uh, in this case, the, uh, the Hessian here is just a, a identity, identity matrix times a constant. So this would be a constant function. And the eigenvalue problem just becomes a Laplace uh, eigenvalue problem. And then we know that the first eigenvalue is n minus two. So if you plug lambda one into n minus two here, uh, this is exactly like the exponent we have for the for the first theorem. So so that's the connection between these two cases. Okay. All right. So let me uh, quickly give you like an outline of how we prove uh, the theorem. Uh, so basically, we a key estimate here is uh, if we just look at the estimate at the at the origin. So a key thing here is we are able to prove gradient of u at zero by the oscillation of u in the square root of, in the cylinder of square root uh, of epsilon, radius of square root of epsilon divided by square root of epsilon, okay? So the reason why this, uh, this scaling here is important is because um, the radius here, uh, the distance here is epsilon. So if you go to the radius to be square root of epsilon, then uh, you look at the cylinder here, all the heights here are comparable to each other. So that means if you flatten the boundary in this region, uh, the Jacobian is just uh, comparable to identity. So what we can do here is like, we can just uh, flatten this boundary and then we will have a, have a divergence forms equations with uh, measurable, co uh, with bounded coefficients. And then we can do reflection to like, um, to extend this uh, area to a unit size. And then we can apply a classical uh, gradient estimate for the, for the divergence from uh, elliptic equation with this continuity in the x and direction. So we get, we are able to prove this, this estimate, okay? So know that for, for this estimate, we only use the information of the oscillation inside the cylinder, inside a synergical area uh, of the uh, radius square root epsilon. So we didn't use anything outside. Um, so our goal here is in order to get a, a good estimate. So our goal here is to, to estimate uh, the oscillation inside the synergical area using the information outside because we haven't used the information outside yet. So uh, we want to uh, use the outside information to, to control the oscillation here. Okay. So the key, uh, a key observation is that uh, we want to study the, uh, the function, which is the averaging function in the x and direction. Okay. So we take the, the, take the vertical average of u and we define it to be u bar and then uh, U bar will be satisfied this uh, red equation. This is a potentially um, degenerate equation, but this equation is good in the sense that now we are working on the domain B1 instead of working in the, in the narrow region that potentially creates a, a cusp. Now we are working on a good um, domain, even though the equation is, uh, is, is getting worse. Um, and on the other hand, by, by the previous result of Pauli Ying, they, they show a, a minus a one half um, gradient estimate. So this tells us that the oscillation between U and U bar is not um, too different um, during this, in, in this narrow region. So in order to estimate the oscillation of U, we can just estimate the oscillation of U bar, okay? And another good thing of this equation is that if you look at the right-hand side here, the right-hand side, if you compare the order, the right-hand side F here will have a power gain compared to the left-hand side. So, so this is pretty much the order of left-hand side and the right-hand side, you have a power gain here. So our strategy is we want to first um, throw, start from this estimate, we throw this information into the equations and then we try to get an improved um, uh, estimate. And then we just try to bootstrap it, throw it to the equation again, 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 and increase the, the regularity until we cannot, okay? So, Basically, so pretty much here, what we need would be, a, as would be an estimate for this equation. Uh, and then we also, we're not satisfied just with an, an equation, with an estimate. We need an ex estimate with explicit exponents because we are interested in the uh, optimal exponents. So we want to know like up to when we can uh, increase this, um, increase this exponent, okay. So here is, so for the first case when F minus G is radial, so here is, uh, here is our, our proposition here. So 
Uh, this is the equation we're interested in. So we put a G here just to make it more general. Um, so basically what we can prove here is we can prove the oscillation of U bar in L2 sense that um, is uh, decays like R to the alpha tilde. So here alpha tilde is the minimum of here. This is the uh, optimal exponent we want and sigma minus one is just the contribution from the right hand side here. So basically here sigma minus one is coming from the right hand side and here the optimal exponent alpha m minus two is coming from the homogeneous part from the left hand side. So uh, I will show you why. So um, the optimal exponents coming from the homogeneous equation, that's because if we uh, you just write out the homogeneous part of the, this elliptic equation and then we write it in the polar coordinates. So this is this would be the equation. And then we do a spherical harmonic decomposition. So we look at the first modes of, of this uh, function. So that means uh, we basically, we just replace this uh, Laplace uh, to be minus n minus two here. And then the first mode will satisfy uh, this ODE here, um, this direct computation. Uh, and if epsilon is equal to zero, we can see that this uh, coefficient here is exactly n over r. And then if this is exactly n over r, then this ODE is just an Euler type ODE that um, because you have like second order here, you have first order, you have zero order, and then you are matching the uh, exponent uh, in the de denominator. So this is pretty much like the first second order ODE, like everyone teach in a undergraduate ODE class. So we know exactly how to solve it. Um, you can just throw in R to the alpha, and then we solve this alpha. Alpha is exactly equal to this number. And then in that case, we can solve the first mode is exactly R to the alpha with this alpha here, okay? But here, um, because we have an epsilon here, this is not exactly N over R. So, uh, but we are still able to use maximum principle to control um, the upper bound of, of the first mode to be bounded by this, this order here. So this is why, um, yeah, this explains how this order is popping up here. This exponent is popping up. It's exact, uh, essentially just coming from this ODE, okay? All right, and that's the first case. And then for the, for the general case when f minus g is not radial, so you will have a, a function of cosi in front of r square. So in this case, we are able to prove a, a similar um, uh, oscillation estimate. Um, so here, this is the equation we have, and then we are able to show that u, u bar has the, uh, the oscillation is again, uh, x prime to the alpha tilde, and alpha tilde is a minimum between uh, this uh, optimal exponent and sigma minus one is the contribution from the right-hand side, okay? So here, a key thing is compared to the previous one, uh, we are not able to uh, incorporate epsilon in front of here. So uh, so for the previous uh, estimate here, we, we, we have an epsilon, but then for the general case, uh, we don't know how to incorporate epsilon here. So we, we drop this epsilon, we just um, use this, uh, we just provide this estimate for this equation. And then, uh, uh, the exponents show up for the for the very similar reason is because uh, if you write the homogeneous part here uh, and then in the polar coordinate, so instead of Laplace, you have a divergence form uh, on equations on S n minus two, and then instead of using spherical de harmonic decompositions, we use the decomposition with respect to the eigenfunctions of this operator. Okay, and that's why this eigenvalue problem comes up um, in our in our setting. So. In this case, um, basically we just replace this by, by lambda minus lambda one. So then we get the first mode. Is it, now this time the first mode satisfy exactly the Euler equation. So the first mode is given by this uh, R to the alpha lambda one, okay? Uh, but the bad thing here is for application because our estimate, we do not have the epsilon in front. So we have to throw the epsilon to the right-hand side to treat it as a perturbation. Um, of the equation. But um, the thing is, if we take R, to the, uh, to the scale of square root of epsilon, then you notice that the left-hand side here and, and the right-hand side, they are of the same order. So in this case, um, the right-hand side, the red term cannot be treated as a perturbation. So that's why um, our estimate here can only provide an oscillation in a, in a scale that is slightly larger than square root of epsilon. So we missed that uh, borderline a little bit because like we, we need to uh, throw this to the right-hand side and then at the exact scale, the right-hand side is no longer perturbation, so uh, we cannot get an estimate. So that's that's the reason uh, why we miss uh, that borderline in the second uh, second theorem. Okay. All right. So that's what I want to talk about uh, for our first results. Um, are there any any questions or comments? 
Yeah, I have a question. Yes, please. It, it looked like F minus G was the important quantity. Yes. Here. Is it important so it, that domains are convex or just that F minus G? Just F minus G is convex. That's that's more important. Yeah. Okay. So so that's that's what we need. That that's yeah. Just F minus G being like relatively convex is more important. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you but, have like concave domain and one beneath mm -hmm. is just more. Yeah, yeah, that that that's also fine. Like you have concave, but the other one is more like tilted. Like mm -hmm. that's, okay. Yeah, yeah, but but for the but I will show in the in the next uh, result that for the yeah uh, for the for the nonlinear ones we need both to be convex. Okay. Um, okay. So so I will yeah I will mention that in a second. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay. All right. So um. Yeah, and then um, now uh, I will talk about some like recent works um, done with Hong Jiedong and Han Yezhu. Um, so we work on the nonlinear uh, conductivity problem for both insulated problem and perfect conductivity problem. So um, so here, so let me just first start with the insulated problem because we just talk about insulated problem a lot. Um, okay, so now um, again, we look at this picture. Uh, so for the for the P Laplace case, so basically what we do is we just replace the the Laplace equation by the P Laplace equation, um, and everything else is the same. You have the, the normal Norman boundary conditions here. And then, um, so what we are able to prove is um, the following um, estimates. So first we prove a, a, a very like general estimate for any dimensions and any P strictly greater than one. So this is an epsilon to the minus one half um, Order estimate. So this estimate is basically the same as the estimate I show you um, in the in the linear case. So we first we produce this estimate, and then only using the information um, in the symmetrical region of the the, um, the radius of square root epsilon, and then we are able to like um, use the outside information to improve this estimate in some certain uh, some some certain range of p and n. Okay, so uh, when p is greater than n plus one, we are able to improve this uh, to be this number. Okay, so this number is, is greater than minus one half. Uh, if you put in uh, conditions here, p the condition of p here, and then this exponent here um, is equal to minus one minus delta over uh, p minus one when n is equal to two. Okay. And then, uh, and this exponent here also tells us the fact that if you fix n here, this exponent go to zero as p goes to infinity. So, um, so, so this estimate shows that uh, the singularity also diminish uh, when p goes to infinity. Okay. And then, uh, uh, in particular, in two dimensions, we are able to create. Uh, we are able to provide examples to show that um, the gradient of u has such a lower bound. So for any delta, we are able to show that for when p is uh, between one and three, this is, uh, we have a, this lower bound and p is greater than three, this is, we have this lower bound here. So this um, result here basically shows that the estimate we show, the, the two estimate we shows here above, uh, the exponent should be uh, critical in the sense that you cannot improve any of this uh, uh, exponents here because we are able to show that uh, you, given any delta, uh, small delta here, you we have an example to show a lower bound can be achieved. Um, so, so that means in two dimensions, our estimate, the first two estimate are pretty much um, optimal, except that we are we are given a little power of the exponent here, but the exponent should be critical in a sense that you cannot in, improve the uh, uh, the exponents here. Okay. And then finally. Um, in for, for dimension greater or equal than three, uh, we are able to show, uh, improve the minus one half by a small beta again. Uh, and then we are able to show that um, when, if you fix P here, beta will go to one half when N goes to infinity. So that means now you, if you fix P here, you send N to infinity, uh, the singularity will also diminish. So, so either case you send P to infinity or you send N to infinity, you will have, your, your solution will be more and more regular uh, in this sense. Okay. So those are the, the main results we have here. Um, so let me show you the uh, a more precise statement of our first estimate. So the first estimate is a, a square root uh, epsilon to the minus one half order estimate. So as you can see here, 
on this estimate is looks pretty much exactly the same as the, the linear case we have. Uh, however, we cannot um, just simply just flatten the boundary and and use classical result because um, I mean to to the to my best knowledge, um, there was no such result for pilaf plus type equations uh, with the discontinuity in x n direction. So uh, unlike the linear case, you can just apply this uh, classical result. So in order to prove this, uh, we need to make some effort. So what we're going to do here, we are, is we are going to use a mean oscillation estimate. So we want to iterate starting from very small ball to a very large ball. Uh, the large ball meaning the ball of radius square root of epsilon. So, um, but then we cannot just simply uh, flatten the, all the boundary together because when we are considered a small ball, uh, the, this boundary flattening might create a Jacobian that is too large compared to the to the radius of ball when the, the radius is small. So basically we need to uh, separate this uh, ball into three different scales. So one is, we call it small scale, it's the red one here. Um, that means the ball, we consider a ball that is completely lying in this, this narrow region. And then the second scale is the middle scale. The middle scale meaning that uh, the ball can potentially just intersect with one boundary. And then the large, larger scale here is the, the blue one. The blue one, um, the ball can intersect with both boundaries. So we need to like separate those three cases um, just for the, for the reason, for the Jacobian reason I mentioned. Um, so for the small scale here, um, when, when the ball is completely lying in this narrow region, so we have the classical results um, for from P Laplace, we will have this mean oscillation estimate. So, uh, the, the the mean oscillation in a small ball has a has a decades uh, comparing to a large ball here, larger ball here. Um, so we have this, and then uh, in the middle scale here. So what we're going to do is we're just gonna flatten the boundary that is intersect with the ball. So we are not going to in, to flatten both boundary. We just flatten one boundary. So in this case, uh, after flattening that boundary we will end up getting the equation. Uh, and if you compare the equation to P Laplace, um, it is small in this sense. So we still have some like uh, oscillation uh, decay, but now we have some error, but this error is manageable um, because of the choice of the scale we have here. And then uh, finally, uh, the large scale is the when R, uh, the ball potentially can intercept with both boundary. And in this case, we just flatten both boundary uh, at once. And then the new equations uh, we have, if you compare to P Laplace, it's small in this sense here. So we still have some like uh, decay of the mean oscillation and then uh, with some error that is manageable, okay? And com combining all this and use a Campanado argument. Uh, so we are able to show that uh, gradient of U is bounded by this, uh, uh, P, P, P norm here of, of gradient U here in a scale of a square root epsilon. And then this, the second line is just by Kachau poly inequality so that you get the uh, oscillation uh, on the right-hand side. So this is roughly speaking how we, how we prove this gradient estimate of the order epsilon to the minus one half, okay? So actually, in fact, here we, we are able to not just prove a Lipschitz estimate, we are able to, we should be able to prove a C1 alpha estimate uh, here and and that estimate turns out to be very important for the perfect conductivity problem I will show you towards the end of the talk. So uh, that can also be done by a similar uh, mean oscillation argument. Okay. All right. So after having this, um, after having this uh, first estimate, so what? So now we are going to pretty much do the same story. So we want to estimate the oscillation in the synergical with radius of square root epsilon using the information outside. Okay. So when P is greater than N plus one, so what we can do here, so we, we, we can prove this estimate. And the, the way we do that is we are able to uh, construct a super solution um, in this form. And this super solution will provide an, a better oscillation estimate, uh, which is the, 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 the exponent we have here. And then so gradient of U will just be this exponent minus one half uh, to be the, the uh, the exponent we have here. And in, in this case, we will need to use the uh, convexity of both boundary because in order to construct the, uh, the super solution here, it's important that the, uh, the sign of the, uh, the normal derivative is uh, uh, match the, the one we want. So in this case, we do need both boundary to be convex, uh, those, those inclusions to be convex. Okay. 
but we we for the first uh first estimate for for this estimate here uh we still don't need uh uh both uh, boundary being convex we just need f minus g being convex so for the first one but for this improved one we will need both boundaries to be uh, convex okay. all right and then uh the second estimate we have here is uh when n is greater or equal than three we are able to improve minus one half to a slightly larger number and the, the way we do that is now we take a uh, annulus region of uh, omega 2r minus omega r and then we are we perform a flattening uh we flatten those two boundaries but we are not just simply just flatten it we we use a more specific one uh to preserve the neumann boundary conditions so so we do this as uh, a more specific flattening boundary so we end up getting a new new function satisfying this non-divergence form equation with the Neumann boundary condition on the top and bottom. Okay? And then uh, we can just uh, do reflection to again, to, to scale into a, a unit scale. And then we can use a uh, Kirillov subfund of uh, HANA inequality for the non divergence form equations. And, and this uh, HANA inequality implies a decay of the oscillation of R. So, so that's how we improve this uh, thing in dimension greater, greater than three. So the, so the key thing we need the dimension to be higher is because that, um, in higher dimension, this annular region, they are connected. Uh, so we can use the HANA inequality, the kudov sapanov theorem here. Uh, in two dimension, these two sides are separated. So uh, you can get an estimate that like, combining together. So, so this, this is only valid in dimension higher. Okay. All right, so finally, um, we are able to show that uh, beta goes to one one half when n goes to infinity. So this part, we use a, a Bernstein argument uh, similar to uh, one cost argument for the, for the linear case. And here, the key observation is that uh, the gradient of u, the p, p power of gradient of u is a subsolution to this uh, normalized p la plus operator. Um, and then, so what we do is basically we construct a, a function q is of order epsilon plus uh, r square. And then we show that this, um, this quantity uh, cannot achieve maximum on the on the top and the bottom boundary, and it cannot achieve maximum inside the, this region. So it can only achieve maximum on this side boundary, meaning that this quantity will be bounded, provides n beta and p satisfy certain conditions. So I didn't write the condition out because it's kind of like uh, lengthy and, and ugly, but that relations implies that when uh, n goes to infinity, you can take beta go to one half. So that uh, that proves our um, final theorem here. Okay. Um, so here around here, uh, we believe that this relation is not optimal, but um, there, there are still a, a lot of like open question like around around this problem here. So this is really just like a starting point, of the, the study of this nonlinear insulated problem. Okay. All right, so, um, so finally, let me just, uh, quickly mention our, our very recent results on the perfect conductivity problem. So now we go back to the perfect problem. Uh, so this is just a joint work uh, with Hong Jiedong and Han Yeju. So uh, we just upload this to archive about like two months ago. Uh, so we started this perfect uh, problem with the P la plus. So let me just remind you for the perfect problem, U has to be constant inside those two region, uh, U1, uh, U1 epsilon and U2 epsilon. So here I put a lot of superscript epsilon here because um, this problem is very uh, connected to the limited problem when epsilon go to zero. So um, I put a lot of superscript here. And um, yeah, and then um, so, so recall that previously there was only L infinity upper bound for the L, L infinity control of the gradient. Uh, in the literature. And then what we do here is we gave a first gradient asymptotic expansion. So we are able to single out the most singular terms uh, from the gradients. Um, so basically this is the, the result. So when P is greater than, than this number, we have uh, this is the most singular term and plus higher order terms. So here I'm being vague about higher order terms because um, there are like a lot of things uh, going on there. So I'm just, uh, um, being vague about the statement here, but um, anyway, but for, for those two cases, these two are the, the singular, the most singular terms here. And here F is the, the flux 
on the first inclusion for the limiting case when epsilon is equal to zero. And then here, the capital U1, U2 are the constants when also for the limiting case for the for those two constants in the inclusions. And here K is a explicit constant we can compute. And here, sigma um, theta epsilon is, uh, is just the, the order it should be. Um, okay. So, um, so let me just uh, mention how how we single out this uh, how we single out this uh, the the singular term from the higher order terms because that's um, the main thing we do here uh, compared to the the L L infinity norm control. So, um, so our our argument is um, this is a very important ingredient is the C one beta estimate I mentioned uh, for the nonlinear problem. So, um, so here. It's important that we have an epsilon to the minus beta over two power popping up here, okay? And why is that important? It is because that now um, for any x uh, in this region, we are able to just use a, a mean value theorem to, to, to see that there is this uh, psi n so that this uh, vertical uh, derivative is exactly equal to this number. So it's um, u1 epsilon minus u2 epsilon divided by the distance here, okay? So if you take the distance between uh, any derivative n with this uh, with at, at this point psi n here, then by the c one beta estimates we are able to get this. And because x n minus beta uh, minus psi n is on the narrow region, so this their uh, distance is less than epsilon. So this results a power gain in this estimate, um, and this power gain will make this uh, the difference of these two being the higher order. So, so that's why we single out this term here to be the, um, to be the most singular term. And the rest is we, we are able to show that um, this uh, u1 minus u2 come, uh, basically behave like this when p is large and behave like this when p is small. So, uh, but those arguments are kind of involved. So um, I'm not going into too much detail here. So uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to stop here and Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions if there's any. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, maybe I just have a quick question. Like um, in many problems that you have, uh, the solution is constant in the holes, right? Are there some var variation or some sort of implicit characterizations of those constants so those yeah so so those constants are uh if you look at the look at the equation so those constants are will be determined by by this line here sure i mean of course it's yeah. tied up yeah. 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 yeah i'm just asking are there some sort of like variation of formulas or some you know like some sort of like yeah so you mean like write out write out this constant like explicitly in terms of something like yeah some variation of characterization or something like that yeah yeah i think yeah yeah i think that's a that's a good point i think i think for the for the linear case that that is possible let me let me let me pull out the this here this is this this result by uh by Bali Ying. so so basically what they what they prove here is they I mean, they're not characterizing just, just one constant, but more importantly, they are interested in, in this u1 minus u2. So they are, more or less, they are able to show that this is behave like a, they, they find a fun, linear functional uh, depending on the boundary value on, on our side. So, so basically they, yeah, for the linear case, they are able to do such a thing um, for u1 minus u2, um, but for the, for the nonlinear case, I, I am not aware of any of this uh, argument. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so if no questions, let's send the speaker again. So thank you, Jordan. Thank you.